Hello, and welcome to Unknowable, the podcast where we talk about all things mysterious, unusual, or unknowable. I'm Justine. And I'm Gray. Some weeks, we break down one larger mystery between the two of us. Other weeks, we pick two smaller mysteries on a theme, and we teach each other about them based on our own independent research. This week, the theme is kind of hard to really pin down, but the threads that connect our two topics are the fact that they are both humanoid creatures and both seem to be immortal. And of course, unknowable. Of course. Of course. So, thinking since you weren't here last week, you go first. Okay. It's going to be awesome. All right. So, who you got? So this week, talking about the Count of St. Germain. Do you know anything about I know nothing. this person? Actually, nothing at all. Nothing? You've never even heard the name before? Never, except when you mentioned that you were doing it. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. So okay. I have no idea. All right. So, Count of St. Germain is an interesting topic because he is both a historical figure as well as a mysterious, potentially immortal figure. Okay. So he factors into a lot of actual historical events. But then kind of goes off the rails sort of in both directions before and after those actual documented events. So he was definitely a real person or there was a real person named the Count of St. Germain. Mm -hmm. Um, He went by several different names. He was Marquis de Montferrat, Comte Bellamar, uh, Prince Ragozzi. Graf Zarogi. Oh, um, the pronunciation on all those is perfect. totally accurate. Oh, sure. So accurate. So accurate. Fucking A. Um, so he lived... So this is interesting. His birth date is two wildly different years. He was either born in 1691 or 1712. Okay. It's like a almost 20 year yeah. like span. Like he was either born this year or this year. We don't know. And then he died in 1784. So... He was roughly 70 or 80 when he died. So that's a pretty long lifespan for back then anyways. Mm. But you'll see that that's not necessarily true. Okay. So during that time period, he lived in Europe. He spoke several different languages, including Portuguese, Spanish, uh, French, German, some weird like um, Sanskrit, and I think um, Hebrew as well. Wow. Um, So he was very learned. He was like an aristocrat. He was part of Louis the Fifteenth's court. Jeez. He met like Madame Pompadour. He met Voltaire. He met um, Mesmer, as in like the guy who they named Mesmerizing after. Whoa, cool. Um, he met Casanova, Whoa. like the Casanova. The Casanova. Yeah, who they named that shit after. Damn. Um, so he was basically just like this random rich arist- aristocrat who uh, would like lived in Europe, was part of the court. Um, I'm going to get into sort of, like, what he did, like, not like it's a job, but as, like, a calling in life. I'm, I'm going to get into that. But um, what he was really well known for was being, like, a great conversationalist. Everybody wanted to talk to him. Everybody wanted to hear his stories. He would tell great stories. Hmm. Um, some of those stories kind of are what have built the mystery about maybe he was immortal. Um, but his sort of, like, calling or whatever he did for a job more or less, was, like, um, chemistry, or back then, alchemy. Yeah. So, back in the day, those two things were fully the same thing. Mm. Same kind of person would, like, try to, like, turn lead into gold that would also, like, discover hydrogen and stuff. So, like, you'd be doing, like, real science stuff, and then also this, like, weird batshit, like... (laughs) Like, trying to, like, make yourself immortal and stuff. Yeah. If I can discover hydrogen, why can't I just make myself rich? Right. Actually, Isaac Come Newton on. was an alchemist. Really? Way before he, like, discovered gravity and everything. Whoa. Yeah. So he, actually, most of the, like, writings that we have of Isaac Newton is him talking about, like, weird alchemist stuff that is, like, we all now know is not real. Damn. <clears throat> or is it real? Because we're about to see some shit. Oh, shit. So he was an alchemist. He would everywhere he moved in Europe, he would set up a, a, a laboratory and would do these experiments there. Um, but he was just like super rich. Like he he loved jewels. Mm. Um, he would like be wearing these like incredibly gaudy outfits. He'd have like jewels on his shoes and like he constantly had money, but nobody knew where he got it from. Mm. There was all these weird like um, like sort of rumors about where he got it. Like maybe he married an empress of Mexico. 
for her money Weird. or he had it passed down from him. Nobody's even really sure where he's from. They think based on the way that he spoke those several languages, his most natural language that he spoke was Portuguese. Okay. So he's probably Portuguese or he just was good at speaking Portuguese. He's either Spanish or Portuguese probably. Right. I mean, if he's immortal, he's had a lot of time. Right. To yeah. perfect his languages. Right. So uh, he was also just sort of like a, a polymath. He was good. He was a, a an accomplished like fine art painter. He was really good at painting jewels. He had like a very like Whoa. scientific way of doing it and representing it like very like photorealistically of painting jewels. That's kind of awesome. None of his paintings exist. Damn it. I know. I was so excited to Ah. see that. So um, he was an accomplished painter. He was an accomplished concert violinist and a composer, which you can actually look up. There's some music that he composed that just exists out there on the internet that you can hear. That we will add to the show notes. Yes. We'll add to the show notes. You can't hear him play it, obviously, because it was the 1700s and they didn't have the internet. Right. But, um... Yeah, so he was just kind of this, like, like renaissance man who could just do sort of everything and was rich and fancy and was, like, just hobnobbing with all these rich people wow. um, for the, the time that he was definitely alive, which hmm. was a roughly 80-year period. So that's sort of, like, the documented facts. Then there's all kinds of other sort of legends about him. So I, I mentioned he met Madame Pompadour, which was a one of, like, the mistresses, I think, of King Louis the Fifteenth. Okay. So he was talking to her, and Madame Pompadour had met a person named the Count of St. Germain back in, like, 1710. Mm-hmm. So it's debatable whether or not this was the same person because, like, like the, the title Count of St. Germain could be applied to several different people, like right. the King of England or whatever. Um, but... When Madame Pompadour met the Count of St. Germain in 1760, okay, she's like, yo, I met you, or did I meet your father back in 1710? Because you look mm. just like this dude, the Count of St. Germain that I met. And he's like, oh, no, weird. I met you back then. And she's like, dude, you are not old enough. Because she, she said he looked like he was maybe in his 30s or 40s. Wow. In 1760. Yeah. So he claims that he met her back in 1710. Whoa. So he hadn't aged a day since 1710. That's awesome. And she's all like, how is that possible? And he's like, oh, it's very possible. Like, I'm a very old person. He made reference to being 100 years old one time. That gave me chills for some reason. <laughs> just him just being like, yeah. yeah. He was like real casual about it. Oh, like, man. And we just throw that shit out there. Why is that freaky? That's right. freaky. <laughs> okay. <laughs> See, I didn't get the chills with any of this. I just oh. thought it was like weird shit. Jesus. He seems like kind of just like a jolly dude. Like, he didn't seem like dark or like he had any like weird proclivities. Yeah. He just seemed like he just was, he likes gold and jewels and you know just hanging out and living life being immortal which like why aren't rich people today like that like i wish rich people today just had like these ridiculous garments and shoes with like rubies and shit Mm. on them why are we past that look at migos look at any (laughs) rapper that's true but like you look at like a ceo of something like why aren't they i mean they've got like their fancy watches look at jeff bezos and his like fucking like yeah. zip up vest right like look at so many of these rich dudes that have more money than we'll ever ever know and they're right. wearing like black turtlenecks tons of money no style no style right yeah it's true damn we gotta get back make rich people great again yeah make rich people wear jewel tones again <laughs> please <laughs> I want them to be more extravagant um where was i <laughs> yeah. fucking a just brought you right off topic uh, right off topic. yeah so he she met him 50 years later, had an age of day. Yes. So he claimed to be 100 years old. Another time, he claimed to be 500 years old. Holy shit. So he told a story one time that he... So, okay, anybody out there who has experienced Christianity in any way, shape, or form mm. has probably heard the story about Jesus turning water into wine. And that was at a wedding. So the Count of St. Germain claimed to have been at that wedding. Whoa. As a guest. Whoa. And saw Jesus turn water into wine. That's amazing. And then he also claimed to be present at the Council of Nicaea in the year 325 AD. Jesus. So he is roughly 2,000 years old. Yeah. At this point. Wow. Um, And these are all like, you know, it's debatable whether or not he was just kind of like trying to play it up and like flex on people or Mm. (laughs) it was true. You know what I mean? So he, another sort of weird little detail about him being immortal, he was known around these courts for selling like what we would call today like anti-aging cream okay. that would like f- smooth out your wrinkles it would um he sold hair dye 
Um, that would like, you know, so if you had gray hair, you could like dye your hair. Yeah. So if he's selling these like weird concoctions that are, he, he, he claimed were very expensive to make, but he wouldn't sell anybody because he had tons of money. So he just did it sort of as like a favor to people in the court. He would Whoa. give them this like really fancy anti-aging cream that apparently worked really well. Hmm. So interesting. Maybe it was some little bit of like elixir of life. Yeah. Um, oh. so Yeah. He supposedly lived for 2,000 years, mm. and then he's in the courts of Europe. He finally gets famous. He, like, makes a name for himself, and um, as he gets older, like, aging into the, the 1780s, he befriends the Prince Prince Charles of Hesse Castle. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Wish you could all see Gray do the shrug that he just did. <laughs> I the think like, it's Hesse Castle. Why didn't fuck that up, Shrug? Hesse Castle? <laughs> um, some principality in Eastern Europe. Yeah, some Some sure. king who has a ton of money and um, he, or a prince who has a ton of money and like owned a bunch of land and stuff and becomes really good friends with this guy. And so he asks the prince of Hesse, Hesse Castle, like, hey, give me a like laboratory because I just figured out this new way to like dye cloth. So the prince is like, sure, whatever, like, we're good friends. Sets up this laboratory, and um, he's doing his thing. He figures out this new way to dye cloth. I don't know why that's significant, but it's very significant. Um, and so while the Count of St. Germain is working at this, or working at his laboratory, his dying place, whatever, he dies, ironically enough. In his dying place. In his dying place, he <laughs> dies, um, which is super ironic. Maybe that's why everybody talks about it being like a, a, a dying facility or whatever. Yeah. Um, but what's interesting about when he dies is that the Prince of Hesse Castle is gone. He's not at home, like in his principality mm. when the Count of St. Germain dies. So, you know, it's back in the day they didn't have embalming or anything. So they buried the Count of St. Germain like ASAP basically before yeah. the Prince has a chance to come home and like officially see him. Okay. So the Prince of Hesse Castle never actually saw the body of Count St. Germain. So interesting. it's an interesting little like, like tidbit, like there's no sort of like formal documentation that he was actually dead because back then it'd be super easy to fake your own death. Yeah. So there's going to, there's some stuff we're going to get into that kind of gives some evidence that maybe he did fake his own death. Yes. So he gets buried, they, uh, inventory his stuff and he just has a bunch of like, like, like a, a decent amount of money. Like he's not like super rich by any means or According to his possessions, he's not super rich by any means. Um, he only had like some random, like, um, like they call it like sundry items, like a comb and stuff. Mm. Um, but like nothing extravagant, nothing crazy, no, no weird, like alchemy materials, even though he was very much involved in alchemy and stuff. Yeah. So it's just kind of weird. Like it makes sense that like he took all his good shit and all his money and just, like, left some stuff to make it seem like he was dead, faked his own death, and, like, pieced out of there. Yeah. So we can move on to his next identity. It would make sense that throughout the years he just would, like, kind of live a life, fake his own death, and then go and start somewhere, start over somewhere. Right. Which is why he speaks, like, six different languages. Yeah. If you don't want to be noticed, if you kind of want to live under the radar. Right. Of just, like, oh, yeah, I'm just casually immortal. Right. Like, hey, weren't you alive, like, a hundred years ago? Yeah. Like, no, that wasn't me. <laughs> like, are you hearing what me? you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. And then you just get drunk once in a while and you're like, you know, I was at that wedding where Jesus turned water into wine and people are like, okay. Yeah, classic Count of St. Germain. <laughs> classic. And yeah, nobody believes you. Right. Which is a sad thing that we only don't believe that people could be immortal just because we don't know of it. Right. I guess. Like, I mean, as far as we know, it's impossible. Right. But things defy science all the time. Right. So we don't really know for sure. Scientists say that the first person to live over like 150 years what has already been born yeah, and using right like science and stuff, they'll be able to live past 150. Shit. It's probably not me. Right. <laughs> probably not me. I either. wish it would be me. Right. I feel like I'm one of the few people I think that would actually want to live forever. Really? Maybe not forever, forever, but a well, long time. I don't know the way things are going right now. Maybe not. Yeah. I feel like I used to think that more when I was younger, like it'd be so cool to live Back like 500 years. Times now, were I'm hopeful. Like, ah, yeah. Is, is there a thing going to be around in 500 years? Right. Like I'm kind of now I'm like, it's kind of okay that I'm going to die at some point. <laughs> still don't want to die soon but like um, you know once there's no more polar bears and the yeah Ar the arctic is a, a thing of the past yeah like what's life going to be like if i can't distract myself from like the bullshit political stuff by looking at videos of cute polar bears right 
Oh. That weird noise, by the way, is my dog. Yeah. She's chewing something under the table. Yeah, she's under the table. Oh. You might have heard a squeak a few minutes ago. That was her yawning. Oh. So. <laughs> anyway. Moo cow. <laughs> Moo cow. So, yeah. So, he was... Um, one little, like, side note about his, his whole alchemy practice. There was one point where he claimed he could fuse diamonds into one bigger diamond. Oh. So, he got, like, a bunch of diamonds, like, five or six diamonds from this person and, like, fused them together and produced one big diamond. That's kind of awesome. Which is also very possible that you could, like... Like, hey, give me five diamonds, and then you give him five diamonds, and you go and sell those diamonds and buy a bigger diamond, and you're like, oh, I fused them together. Yeah, you know totally I mean? fused them. Like a like a like a pyramid scheme. Yeah, kind of. Oh man, so he could have just been like one of the first multi level marketing people. Right. He's selling anti aging cream. You, <laughs> you give me five diamonds, and then yeah. you like tell five people to give me five diamonds. Yeah, and then I'll give you a way bigger diamond. Wow. Yeah, he's just full of shit. Interesting, and that's why he like faked his own death because he was like in over his head. Yeah, exactly. Interesting. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, so there's all these, like, weird little, like, weird little details about his, his life and what he, what he did. Yeah. So, the sort of interesting part is what happens after his, quote, death. So, he died, supposedly, in 1784. So, he, right. So, in 1785, the very next year, he is seen in Germany by Mesmer, the guy who I mentioned earlier. Okay. So Count Mesmer said, like, yo, like, I was hanging out with the Count of St. Germain, and it was definitely him, because, like, Shit. he knew him. Shit. 1785, a year later. So then, also in 1785, the Council of Freemasons, which, you know, like, secret society, some sketchy shit going on there. Sketchy shit. The Council of Freemasons elected the Count of St. Germain as their representative. What? Which it's possible, I guess, that, like, they didn't know he was dead, because it was 1785. Right. Yeah. And that's only a year later. Or it's possible... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was Mukau again. <laughs> again, squeaking in the background. Squeak! Um, or it's possible that he was there, and they elected him because he was there, and then he's like, oh shit, I'm supposed to be dead. <laughs> yeah, whoops. <laughs> Just made this way too public. Damn it. Fuck. Um, in 1789, he was seen during the storming of the Bastille during the French Revolution. Whoa. He was also supposedly present at the execution of Marie Antoinette. Jesus. People saw him, talked to him, women had like an extended conversation with him. Jesus. And like was sure like it was definitely him because she had met him before. He gets around. Right. He's he's, a lot he of just cool shit. like cruising around doing all he's been like at the, the at Jesus's wedding. And... <laughs> Jesus's wedding. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus himself getting married. Yeah, getting married. Um and then sort of an interest like so sort of the last time he's like for sure like spotted throughout history was in eighteen twenty one. Whoa. So if he was indeed spotted in 1821, he would be well over 100 years old, like yeah. around 130 years old. And so it was this person named Major Fraser. He was present at, I'm actually not even sure where he was, but it doesn't really matter where he was. He was somewhere mm-hmm. in Europe mm-hmm. and someone remarked that he had this like really steel trap of a memory and he had all these memories of like specific parts of Europe, spoke several languages and this person, Major Fraser, also claimed to have met Nero, yep. the Roman emperor, and also um, spoke with Dante, as in, like, Dante's Inferno wow. at some point. So if you take all of these sort of legends together, you have this person who is an alchemist who discovered how to make, they call it the Philosopher's Stone. Mm-hmm. We were just talking about Harry Potter before we started recording. <laughs> yeah, we were. Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, but the Philosopher's Stone. The, the Philosopher's Stone is supposed to turn lead into gold, which would explain how he had this vast source of wealth that nobody really knew where he got it from, and he would just kind of make stories up about. Yeah. Um, how he was able to live, you know, for 2,000 plus years. Yeah. Um, and he basically just would reinvent himself every generation and become a new person. He was, you know... Between zero AD and nowadays, he's probably had, I don't know, a couple hundred. How many generations would that be, actually? I don't know. I was just thinking the other day how many years are in a generation. Like, is it like 30 years? I don't know. I think it's rough. I think it's rough. Yeah. I, I always go with like 100 years for some reason because I feel like in 100 years, there's complete turnover of like the population. Right. But like, if we're saying like if we're in a different generation than like mom and she's only got 30 ish years on us yeah, that's true i feel like maybe it's like 30 35 years maybe hmm. even like 25 to 35 or something like that interesting i don't know but many many generations yeah 
many generations, and um, he would still be alive today. Yeah. There was a person in 1971 who claimed to be the Count of St. Germain. Whoa. But um, he committed suicide. Damn. They found his body. So I guess it could have been him and he and killed himself. He was himself. Just starting a new life. Right. But, yeah. Or he was starting a new life and he, like, killed a body double or something. Right. Um, and then there's a whole sort of, like, section of people on the internet who think that Sidney Pollock, the actor, is the Count of St. Germain. Really? And it's because if you look at the picture of Count of St. Germain, the one and only existing picture of him, he does bear a passing resemblance to Sidney Pollock. Interesting. Which I feel like is both likely and unlikely, if you are to believe this, because on one hand, not to disparage Sidney Pollock in any way, shape, or form, but he's not the most well-known, famous, or greatest actor to have ever lived. Mm. Um, and so you would think that somebody with this va- these vast resources and sort of like huge experience throughout 2,000 years of life would sort of be a better, more well-known actor. Right. But maybe he purposely has kind of kept it low-key so that yeah. nobody looks into his background too much. He's staying under the radar. Right. Yeah. If that it's somebody who's, like, been famous for years and years and is, like, huge and hasn't lost popularity. I mean, right. not that somebody's going to be like, you know, is this guy immortal? Right. <laughs> What's going on here? But just staying, yeah, under the radar. Interesting. Which, hey, yeah, he has aspects of both because he definitely seems like he's a little bit flamboyant with, like, his wealth. Right. And being out there and being popular and stuff. But then he doesn't seem like he wants everybody to know all his business. Right. Which is kind of interesting. Or it seems interesting, too, because, like, he he sort of, like, like played under the radar for, like, 2,000 years or 1,700 years. And then all of a sudden, you know, is, like, getting drunk and he's like, yo, I'm 500 years old, whatever. Yeah. And then he was like, shit, this is a bad idea. And then yeah. in, like, the 1780s, faked his own death and just went super underground. So maybe he, like, learned his lesson, yeah. you know? He just got bored with just, like, living under the radar and then finally wanted, like, some wealth and prestige. And then he got it and realized, like, wow, this is a bad idea. Yeah. People are going to start to figure me out. Right. Which, again, it's kind of cool in the sense that, I mean, if that was a real thing, if somebody could be immortal, that, again, nobody would... There's not that many people that would, like, truly 100% be like, this guy's fucking immortal. And then even if they did think that, like, how are you going to prove it? Right. really can't prove it. Like, nobody's really going to believe you. Well, but there's nothing you can do right. to, like, be like... Even if you saw a picture of somebody a hundred years ago that looked like the guy, like, that... Because there's tons of those. All the time. There's yeah. that person who looks just like Jay-Z. Yeah. Who was, like, alive back in, like, the 1800s. And that dude who looks just like Nick Cage. Yep. Yeah. I can so. really believe that Nicolas Cage was immortal. <laughs> yeah. He's, he's been alive for so long that he just fried his brain. <laughs> yeah, he's another example of somebody where it's like you'd think if he had all this time he'd be a better actor, but no. He's just having fun at this point. Or maybe just because you're immortal doesn't mean you have, like you can just all of a sudden do whatever you want. Right. He was, okay, so the Count of St. Germain was an accomplished violinist. Um, he was a decent fine art painter. Yeah. Um, so he was like a musician and maybe a visual artist, but that doesn't necessarily mean you can be an actor. Right. It doesn't mean you're, doesn't mean you're good. Just because you are alive for 2,000 years and can turn lead into gold doesn't mean you're good at acting. Right. You know what I mean? You can't just teach that to somebody. Right. So maybe he's just been like, damn it. He's trying. He's, he's trying, trying to like like live out his passion, but it's just like, yeah, he's not that great at he's it. He's good at so many other things. Right. But just can't be good at everything. Wow. Yeah. That's awesome. So that's the Count of St. Germain. Damn. A potentially immortal human being. That's awesome. So what do you classify that as? He's not a cryptid. Right. He's not a cryptid. He's, he's, he's not just a human. No. Yeah. If he's immortal and we have obviously no idea why he's immortal. Right. How this came about. The whole what, alchemy like angle is. kind of explains it, but that's not necessarily like if he was alive during the time of Jesus, then why like how did he all of a sudden like i don't feel like people living in the desert at the time of jesus were like you know that like chemistry savvy right so i don't understand how he would have become an, an alchemist like way back then yeah i don't know could have picked it up later maybe i'm maybe i'm just like being you know I'm a modern like white person and thinking like oh they couldn't have figured out right. chemistry back then yeah well it's just like people i mean although on one hand people who were like oh the Egyptians couldn't have possibly built the pyramids because right. whatever, like it had Fuck to be that. aliens. Yeah. And it's just like, but they did all kinds of crazy shit. Like, right. I'm not saying that. that the aliens didn't necessarily build the pyramids, but I'm saying it's shitty to assume that right. people couldn't figure that shit out when what else do you got to do all day? Exactly. You can't watch TV, you don't have a smartphone. Yeah. There's nothing else going on. Building pyramids. You're like, I, mean, I might as well. It's mind blowing when you look at them. Right. You're like, how the hell? Right. These heavy ass blocks. Right. And you're, I, yeah, I, like, it boggles the mind. Right. But it happened. And it was maybe aliens. Right. 
Maybe Could the aliens happens. helped. Yeah, the aliens helped. I don't know. Maybe they were all just hanging out together. Oh, we gotta do an ancient aliens topic. Oh, yeah. Because there's a be. um, that's a love hate it's relationship be, for me. Yeah, that's gonna be a whole thing. Well, that was a good topic. Yeah. Thank you. All right. So, how much do you know about my topic, which is Spring Heel Jack? Spring Heel Jack. So, I've heard the name. Yeah. I know vaguely that it was like Victorian England. Yep. And it was just some somebody who was jumping around. <laughs> Jump <laughs> around. That's yeah. That's that pretty much sums it up. That's all I know. Mhm. Yep. Yeah. So, um, Spring Hill Jack. Again, somebody who we're not sure how long he was around for, <laughs> how long he had been around before he was first sighted um, in England, but the first known sighting was in 1837. Okay. In London. And basically it kind of spanned from like 1837 to 1904 where he oh, was wow. sighted. So yeah, like a good long while. Um, and essentially, yeah, he started off being sighted in London and, but there were sightings all over Great Britain. Um, a lot of them were in suburban London, uh, the Midlands, which is like central England and Scotland. Okay. So his first appearance, October, 1837, this girl named Mary Stevens was walking to Lavender Hill, which sounds so nice. So pleasant. A shopping and residential street in South London, um, where she was working as a servant. A lot of the sightings were by servant girls. Hmm. Um, she was walking through a common, and this weird figure leapt at her from a dark alley. Um, he grabbed her with a, quote, tight grip of his arms, and began to kiss her face while ripping at her clothes, um, she described the feeling of his hands as, quote, cold and clammy as those of a corpse. Wow. Which is great. Um, she screamed, which made him flee away. Um, I guess there were a few other people nearby that heard her screaming and came to help and search for the guy and they couldn't find him. Hmm. Um, so that's just kind of odd and that kind of sets the stage for how a lot of his sightings were. Like he just did a lot of shit like that where he just popped out of nowhere and terrorize somebody momentarily and then just like ran mm. off that whole like sexual component of it is strange too yeah yeah i was kind of surprised by that i didn't hmm. really know that about him um yeah and then the next day it was another victim kind of close to where she had been the spring Hill jack character leapt in front of a passing carriage which caused the driver of the carriage to lose control and crash and severely injure himself jesus yeah and then several witnesses claimed that the attacker leapt over a nine-foot wall while babbling with a high-pitched ringing laughter. Weird. Which, again, the jumping over the wall is something that he does a lot. Interesting. That's, that's kind of his thing, hence Spring Heel Jack. Jack. Yeah. Weird. Yeah. That, like, maniacal laughter is super creepy, too. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, he's a super weirdo. So, um, yeah, so that's October 1837. So a few months later... January 1838, the Lord Mayor of London, oh. which is a fancy title, fancy. Sir John Cowan, um, revealed at a public session he had gotten an anonymous complaint that the person only signed it, uh, quote, a resident of Peckham, so they didn't want to say who they were, but it described, among other things, that, quote, the unmanly villain has succeeded in depriving seven ladies of their senses, two of whom are not likely to recover but to become burdens to their families. So they had just heard from all these other people having encounters with somebody that sounded similar to <laughs> this first encounter, which this first encounter wasn't known yet. This wasn't in the papers or anything. Right. Um, so, so and is like, like the translation of that, that he like raped seven girls. I don't think so. I think like essentially just like that other girl, like that he just scared the shit out of some people. Wow. It's kind of hard to decipher some of the language from the <laughs> right. time because yeah, like there's a lot of mentions of, people losing their senses and people um, becoming like overtaken by fits. Hmm. And I'm not totally positive what that means in the context of what they're talking about. Like a panic attack maybe? Or like, right. a, like some sort of like, like psychological break from reality. Yeah. Like brought on by severe stress or something. Them simply like them saying um, seven ladies of their senses, two of whom are not likely to recover, to, but to become burdens to their families. I mean, Right. We know that at that time, somebody who was, like, thought to be insane right. was thought to be a burden. Like, that was not something that people often just dealt with. And 
right. handled. I mean, I'm, I don't I have no idea what the mental health system was like at the time, but that was not, not really not great. Yeah, not really a thing. So, Interesting. Um, yeah, it said the figure has been, quote, visiting many of the villages near London in three different disguises, a ghost, a bear and a devil, which is also a thing that was kind of mentioned a few times in recollections of Spring Hill Jack was that he didn't just take the form of a man. Hmm. And the form of man that he did take was more of, like, that of a devil. That was how people described him. Um, but, yeah, there's a few, which, like, the bear thing just seems so weird. Like, the ghost yeah. and the devil, I'm like, okay, those two go together. But then, like, him also appearing as a bear or, like, another four-legged animal is just I wonder, too, random. like, so my cultural sort of, like, idea of what a ghost looks like is, like, like the classic, like, sheet ghost. Mm. But, like, I wonder what their cultural idea when when you said like he looked like a ghost like what yeah. were they thinking you know what i mean right That's yeah that is it's about. interesting too because there's something that'll come up a little later about ghosts in relation to spring hill jack which yeah made me pause too because i was kind of like huh hmm. that seems odd but right. yeah it um it mentioned one particular encounter where a female servant answered the door when the bell rang and this guy was at the door and the girl has quote never from that moment been in her senses which is just like, Jesus Christ. Wow. Um, the writer said that it had been going on for some time, but that the papers had been silent, and the writer believed that they, quote, have the whole history at their finger ends, but through interested motives are induced to remain silent. So this anonymous writer fully believed that, like, people in power knew that this was happening and weren't reporting on it. Weird. So, not sure why. Um, the mayor was pretty skeptical, but... There was somebody in the audience that confirmed that there had been servant girls in nearby towns telling, quote, dreadful stories of this ghost or devil. Which, again, just, like, interesting to put those two things together. Right. But, yeah, so there's essentially people who were like, no, dude, like, we've heard about this, too. Hmm. This isn't just some random thing. Um, so, I believe that same day, it was reported in the Times, a British daily newspaper, um, and in other national papers on the next day... And then the following day, the 11th, the Lord Mayor showed a crowd a pile of letters from various places in and around London complaining of similar, quote, wicked pranks. Um, there were tons of letters pouring in with similar stories of, again, particularly young girls being terrorized by this figure, mm -hmm. um, which suggested that it was more widespread than they thought. Um, yeah, the letter described young women being frightened into dangerous fits and some, quote, severely wounded by a sort of claws the miscreant wore on his hands. It's another oh, common weird. thing. People have described him having claws. It's interesting that they describe him as wearing claws. I was going to say, yeah, he doesn't have claws. Yeah. He's wearing claws. He's wearing claws. Um, and it was claimed that several people had died of fright, which wow. I don't know if that was true or not. Right. Who knows? They could have seen something else. But right. So there wasn't really any stories of him killing anybody in the sense of, like, violently murdering them, but there right. were stories of him causing deaths by scaring the shit out of people. Wow. Yeah. So the Lord Mayor is still skeptical, um, thinking it impossible, quote, that the ghost performs the feats of a devil upon earth, which just like, again, I wish people still talked this way. Right. So That's amazing. Wild. Like the Lord Mayor of London is talking about the feats of a devil upon earth. Like, wow. awesome. Um, but someone he trusted had told him of a servant girl who had been scared into fits by a figure in a bear's skin. What the fuck, man? Weird. He's just, like, just taking different forms and just fucking around with people. Um, so, at this point, the police are instructed to search for this guy. Rewards are offered. Nothing really happens. Um, so, yeah, this is January. So, two of the most, the best known of Spring Hill Jack sightings take place in February. Of that same year, 1838. Um, there's two teenage girls, Jane Alsop and Lucy Scales. So, Jane Alsop... The night of February 19th, 1838, she's in her father's house. She hears somebody kind of calling from, like, the street or the alley outside saying, like, hey, we've got Spring Hill Jack out here. Like, come help bring a light. Um, so she gets a candle. She goes to the door. She said she noticed that the man was wearing a large cloak. <laughs> um, she said the moment she handed the candle over, he threw off the cloak and, quote, presented a most hideous and frightful appearance shooting blue and white flames from his mouth while his eyes resembled, quote, red balls of fire. Um, what the fuck even is that? I know. She reported that he wore a large helmet and that his clothing, which was very tight-fitting, resembled white oil skin, which is like a waterproof garment that, like, sailors and fish plant workers would wear, like a kind of skin-tight 
waterproof like thing. Like a wetsuit. Yeah, like a wetsuit. Yeah. Weird. He didn't say a word, but he grabbed her and started tearing at her gown with his claws, which she was certain were, quote, of some metallic substance. Hmm. So again, it doesn't seem like it's, you know, maybe it's his physical claws. Maybe it's confusing people because they seem metallic. So they right. don't seem like they'd be part of him. Or yeah, he's wearing these claws. Um... It seems like she must have gone out of the house to, like, meet with this guy because it says that he chased her towards the house, um, caught her on the steps. He actually, like, ripped her flesh with his claws before her sister, I guess, came out and, again, kind of scared him off and he ran away. So. Weird. He has a lot of encounters like this where it's, like, it seems like he's capable of doing a lot more. Right. But if another person comes or whatever, he gets scared off. Like, he's trying to instill fear but not actually, like, kill anybody. Yeah. Like, it seems like he definitely could. And he seems like he has the physical power, but he doesn't actually kill anybody. Um, so yeah, just a, a couple weeks later, or not even, uh, the February 28th, 18-year-old Lucy Scales and her sister were had visited their brother, who was a butcher in like a respectable part of town, which again, I think is in these stories mentioned so that it's not, I don't know, right. some sketchy part of town where who knows what's going on. Like this is a nice right. part of town. Visited their brother. They were passing along Green Dragon Alley, Ooh. which is so cool. Damn. Um, they saw some person kind of standing in like the passageway to the alley. When Lucy got closer, <clears throat> she noticed that he was wearing a large cloak and he spurted, quote, a quantity of blue flame in her face, which momentarily blinded her. And I guess she was scared so much that she just dropped to the ground and again, was seized with violent fits that lasted for hours. So I'm still not clear on what that means, but Aaron, what if it's like some kind of like chemical agent? Like, it sounds like if you, like, like, I don't know, like, some kind of gas or something that's, yeah. like, affecting people ne- neurologically, which right. would cause you to have, like, a, quote, fit or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Were these similar to, like, seizure type of things? Was this person just unable to, like, talk for a while because they were so overwhelmed and scared? I don't really know. Hmm. But, yeah. She was freaked the hell out. Um Her sister later described him as being tall, thin, and of a gentlemanly appearance, which again is very common in descriptions of him. Like, I'll put on the show notes some illustrations from the time of him, but he always, like, looks like, yeah, this, like, skinny, like, well-dressed kind of devil dude. He's kind of pointy, and, yeah, he looks like a gentleman, like, which I think probably aids in the fact that people, like, might approach him or answer the door or whatever. Like, he looks like, yeah, like a well-to-do guy. Interesting. But he's also kind of a devil. Right. Yeah. Like spurting blue flames and whatnot. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, tall, thin, gentlemanly, um, large cloak, and he was carrying a lamp similar to those used by the police. And yeah, he didn't attack them. He just shot the flames and then walked away. Hmm. Like, that was just all he wanted to do. What the fuck? Um, Yeah. So in March, uh, the Times reported her attack. I guess um, the first attack, the one, the girl who answered the door was the more publicized one. The other one wasn't quite as much. Um, So there was a dude named Thomas Milbank who was like boasting somewhere to some people that he was Springheel Jack. Um, Classic Thomas Milbank. (laughs) Yeah. Just like, dude, that was me. (laughs) It was awesome. Um, He was actually tried, like arrested and tried in court. He had been apparently wearing white overalls and a great coat, like a large overcoat, which were both found outside the house and as well as the candle he had been holding, like the candle that she brought to him. Right. Um, but he escaped conviction only because Alsep insisted her attacker had breathed fire, which he admitted he could not do, <laughs> which is you awesome. You got me. Yeah. They're like, we found some of your shit out here. And then he's like, yeah. And they're like, wait, wait. She said you were breathing fire. And he's like, fuck, can't do that. Right. So I don't. Like classic Victorian England, like such good, like physical evidence, like his possessions are outside, but like, oh. Can't, yeah, can't breathe blue like, fire. Oh, you say you can't. Like, okay, that's got to be like like the the crux of the conviction there. Yeah, which I'm confused in general. Like, I mean, if he's admitting to being Spring Hill Jack, why not just be like, yeah, dude? I mean, was he worried they were gonna make him prove it? Right. I feel like that's the thing they would have done. <laughs> they would have just right. been like, you know what? B- breathe some fire. Breathe some fire right now in court. And he's like, fuck. Jump over this table. Can't do it. Yeah. Like, here's a ten foot wall. Jump over <laughs> it. And he's like, can't do that shit. So yeah. So that was um that. About a month after that, there was kind of an odd report from a uh, the Brighton Gazette, which was then also reported in the Times, that apparently there was a gardener in Rose Hill, Sussex, which I was struck researching this topic, by the way, by there's so many places in England 
where it's like here in the United States, I feel like you typically just have like Portland, Maine. Yeah. It's just like city or town and state and that's, <clears throat> you're good. You're good. Like you right. don't really list the country name, but like England, there were like several places I looked at that were like five different names. <laughs> it's like Rose Hill, Sussex, like four other British sounding things. And then like England. And I'm like, what the fuck? Like, they just want to be super specific about yeah. where they are. It's like a, like a, you know, village inside of a town, inside of like a city, inside of a county, mm. inside of a country. And it's just like, this is too much. <laughs> so Rose Hill, Sussex, this gardener had been terrified by a creature saying, and the article said, you know, Spring Hill Jack seems, it seems has found his way to the Sussex coast. Um, it was kind of mentioned that the report didn't really resemble the other accounts, but it did say that the gardener saw a creature quote in the shape of a bear or some other four footed animal that, I guess, growled to get his attention, climbed up the garden wall, ran along the wall on all fours, and then jumped down to the garden and, like, chased him around before, like, leaping over the wall and leaving. So... Weird. So the, the, the common thread is jumping over that wall. Yeah. And the whole <clears throat> form of a bear thing. Right. Which there had been other mentions of a bear, so I don't know why right. that wasn't totally, but maybe just that it wasn't a dude that attacked somebody and then ran off, you know, hmm. breathing fire. Um... Yeah, so at this point, Spring Hill Jack is, like, a big deal, like, talked about by a lot of people. He's the topic of all these discussions. There's, like, plays about him. Um, Penny Dreadfuls, which were, like, these cheap kind of sensational stories that would usually be published in, like, multi-parts at the time, were had him as a topic. Um, I was kind of bummed there were, like, these kind of leaflets that had been passed around about Spring Hill Jack that were not really portrayed as fiction, even though... They kind of were, but I think it kind of helped to fuel the the fire of like, oh shit, like there's this Spring Hill Jack. Um, And I guess there had been copies of like these original leaflets, but they were lost in the the 40s in the Blitz. Fucking Hitler, dude. (laughs) Yeah, I think there was like... God damn it. I thought the thing that I read said there was like one, like maybe the original one had been also stored somewhere else or something and and that remained, but a bunch of them were gone. God damn it. Yeah, which is a real bummer. Fucking Nazis. Fucking Nazis, man. So, yeah, so they're kind of, he's becoming more popular in the culture of this, like, area, and then people just talking about him, like, yeah, in the popular culture, essentially, even though sightings of him are becoming less frequent, until 1843, this is like, yeah, so this is five years after that gardener, um, and, like, Jane Alsop's attack and everything, there was another wave of Spring Hill Jack sightings hmm. across the country, um... A report from Northamptonshire, which again is so fancy, so fancy, described him as, quote, the very image of the devil himself with horns and eyes of flame. Um, East Anglia reports of attacks. Yeah, basically just like these attacks on these coach drivers were just like commonplace. He would just pop out of somewhere and fuck with somebody that was driving one of the the coaches and make them crash and then just like run off. Great. Yeah. So he's just kind of like a dick prankster. Right. He just doesn't really do anything outright violent. It's just like he's just having fun yeah. fucking with people. He's a troll on the yeah. internet. Yeah, exactly. He's like a real life troll. Hmm. Yep. So, um, yeah, really bizarre. There were several people that were investigated that were supposedly doing the attacks, but nothing was ever really proven or they could have just been imposters. Right. Kind of, I don't know. It seems like there were a lot of people at the time that were just thinking it was fun to impersonate Spring Hill Jack. Right. Well, it's like how when you have like a serial killer that's on the loose, people will false confess to it because they want either fame or they're just like that weird psychological impulse to be like associated with this awful thing that's going on. Yeah. Yeah. That. And maybe it helped that he wasn't actually killing anybody. Right. That he was just doing weird shit. Right. And scaring people. So it's not like somebody was tacking their name onto a killer. It was just... Oh, yeah, like, I did that. I'm this weird fucking (laughs) hard-to-classify cryptid. Yeah, I can jump over walls. It's awesome. Um, Yeah, so it kind of starts, like, early 1870s. He's reported again. Um, 1872, the News of the World had reported about the Peckham ghost causing a state of commotion. Um, And they kind of made the link of, like, oh, no, like, that's spring Jack who terrified a past generation. Um, So this kind of... I'll, again, get into this ghost connection later, but that is a common thread, too, that there will kind of be a ghost of a certain area that people are like, oh, no, that's obviously Spring Hill Jack, like, doing the same <laughs> shit. Um, yeah, and then in April and May of the following year, there were numerous sightings in Sheffield of a park ghost 
which again, locals came to identify as Spring Hill Jack. So Weird. kind of bizarre. Yeah, the sightings kind of continued for the next few years until, again, one of the most notable reports. In August 1877, there were a group of soldiers in these barracks in Aldershot, England. There was a sentry that was peering into the darkness and saw this weird figure kind of coming towards him. He <laughs> says he issued a challenge which went unheeded, which I don't know. You know, sure. like, stay the fuck back or I'm going to shoot you. I don't know. Right. Um, dude didn't care, kept coming up to him. The figure came up beside him. You're going to love this. And just slapped his face several times. <laughs> and then, I guess a guard nearby, like, shot at the figure and there was no effect. They weren't sure if he actually hit him. Maybe right. he missed. Maybe there was warning shots. But wow. typical spring heel Jack. A classic spring heel Jack. Just came out of the dark just to slap this slap guy. Slap a fool. And, like, I'm just picturing him being... I don't even know. Like, do you remember that devil from Futurama? Yes. I'm like picturing him kind of being like the that. Like just, devil? yeah. <laughs> yes, like just too. coming out of nowhere and just like coming up, but like I'm picturing him really like his face super close to the guy and just yeah. like slap, 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 slap. And then yeah. just running away. Right. Like again, he thinks it's really funny. I have been actually picturing the robot devil in my head this yeah. whole time. That's Perfect. Weird. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. He's the robot devil. It's great. So yeah. And then they, they also described him as disappearing back into the darkness, quote, with astonishing bounds. So, oh. those spring heels, man. Um, he was reported in Lincolnshire later that same year wearing a sheepskin. Apparently a mob, like an angry mob, cornered him and shot at him and didn't have any effect. And he just leapt over the crowd and escaped. What the fuck? I don't know what he was doing in the sheepskin. Right. <laughs> Why did they corner him? That's like him the weirdest with? part. Like the rest of it is like, makes some logical sense. Like, yeah. okay, he's like a devil or dresses up like a devil and does whatever. But like, why are you putting on... Yeah. Like, the skin of animals, man. Yeah. And then it's unclear, like, is he still in his normal form, like, on all fours, which is, like, you know, again, I'm picturing, like, a sheepskin rug just, like, draped over him. Right. One of those ones that, like, still has the, like, hands and feet and stuff on it. Yeah. Or is he turning into these animals? Right. Is he, like, shape-shifting? Right. Because I would think in that case, like, if it, if he was actually a sheep, then they probably wouldn't have cornered it because they right. wouldn't be like, what the fuck? Like, what is that? We're going to shoot that sheep. Is that a sheep? So, like, it must have looked like a man in a sheepskin. Right. Like, fucking around. Hmm. Yeah. Um, there was a, a man named Lord Ernest Hamilton, who was a soldier from the United Kingdom, who wrote a memoir in 1922 in which he also mentioned similar appearances um, when his regiment was barracked at a, a different area, not that other barracks, um, in the winter of 1878. There were apparently sentries that were issued ammunition in order to shoot, quote, the night terror on sight. Hmm. But this guy writing the memoir thought that they were just pranks. He didn't think it was anybody, hmm. you know, supernatural, paranormal in any way. Um, yeah, so there's just like a couple other random sightings and then kind of it all just like drops off at some point. So nobody really knows what the hell that was. Um, yeah, he's described as devil-like. He has, like, this terrifying appearance, the red balls of fire for eyes. The breathing out the blue and white flames is, like, for me, the most memorable part. Yeah. Like, when I was researching him, I knew a little bit about him, but that was, like, what stuck in my mind was yeah. that he could just breathe fire. Right. Um, and, yeah, that he wore these metallic claws. There were at least two people who claimed that he was able to speak comprehensible English. So, hmm. again, very humanoid. Right. I would love to know, like, what those sightings were and what he said. Right. Um, that one sighting did say that he kind of ran off, like, but that seemed like he was just speaking gibberish, like, wasn't really right. speaking, but I would love to know, like, what he said. Um, so, yeah, some writers have theorized that the legend of Spring Hill Jack came from these earlier legends of ghosts that stalked the streets of London. Um, the Hammersmith ghost, which was, like, in the early 1800s. Um, the Southampton ghost, which would actually assault individuals at night. And some of these ghosts have several characteristics that they share with him as far as like them being able to jump over these tall buildings or not tall buildings, but like tall walls, jumping over houses, um, and being super tall, like 10 feet tall. Hmm. So yeah, again, I am curious like you as to like what people in like the London area in the 1800s, how they envisioned a ghost looking. Right. Because that kind of makes it seem like maybe ghosts didn't really look much different than people was ghost just like a catch-all term for anything that was like out of the ordinary right or was it like a very specific image in their head that would be conjured yeah right because i think it is hard to like shake the idea of a ghost being at least like semi-transparent right and i mean really 
and a lot of times, like in popular culture, like ghosts are, you know, not even necessarily in a humanoid shape. Right. They're just kind of like a blob. Yeah. Or like a mist or right. whatever. So, yeah, maybe at the time it was just more like a person exhibiting some type of like non, not totally human characteristics. Right. I don't know. Yeah. Hmm. So it has been theorized, of course, that he's just, it was just some mischievous person or people. Right. Um, generally, the idea is that it was like one or two original people and then like imitators later on. Right. Um, there was this Irish nobleman, the Marquess of Waterford, who was a main suspect for a while because he was kind of known for like getting into drunken brawls and vandalism and stuff like that. And I guess he had a history of not really having great experiences with women or with police. So it kind of made sense that he's trying to like evade the police. He's harassing a lot of women. It seems circumstantial at best. Yeah. He, he died in 1859 though. And there were sightings after that. So, which again, maybe he was one of the original people and there were imitators who knows, (laughs) but yeah. Um, mass hysteria has also been suggested, of course, yep. because the time Always. there's a lot of superstition in that time frame, sensationalist publications and very rich folklore of the culture. Right. So there's of course the idea, like as with any of this stuff, like once it starts to get out there and it becomes popular, maybe people are just right. imagining it. Or everybody just made it up. Yeah. Right. It all just got made up and whatever. Um, there are paranormal explanations, of course. Of course. Good. That he's an extraterrestrial entity with non-human features, like the glowing eyes and the ability to breathe fire. Interesting. And a superhuman ability deriving from life on a high-gravity world, like his unnatural jumping. Oh. Um, or that he was a demon who was either summoned by the occult or, I like this one, made himself manifest to create spiritual turmoil. <laughs> so again, Manifested he's just, himself. He's just a troll. Wow. Yeah, he's a demon troll. Um, some Fortean authors, so the phrase... 14, if you don't know. I don't. I don't hope I'm saying that right. Refers to Charles Fort, who was an American writer and researcher who specialized in anomalous phenomena. Oh. Yeah. Um, such as Lauren Coleman. Oh, who, shit. Yeah. Portland, Maine. Who was an American cryptozoologist who established the Cryptozoology Museum in Portland. Damn. And Jerome Clark, who was a researcher who specialized in, like, UFOs and aliens and stuff like that. Hmm. Um, put him in the category of phantom attackers. They appear to be human and may be perceived as simple criminals, but display extraordinary abilities and or cannot be caught by the authorities. Interesting. Yeah. Which is kind of interesting that, again, like, that still doesn't sum him up. No. Like, he's just some humanoid with, yeah, some non-humanoid characteristics, but, like, nothing crazy. Right. The claws, I mean, who knows? And, again, we talked about this not on the air here, but... He reminds me in a way of Injured Cold, yeah. who we talked about in episode right. one, yep. where I think the the vision I have in my mind of him like having this helmet and this skin tight kind of weird like wetsuit on, right. um, the cloak, I mean, who knows? But a lot, yeah, if you look at a lot of the pictures, which again, I'll put in the show notes, like he just, he looks odd. Right. I'm sure maybe he fit in better at the time, but yeah, just picturing this dude in a helmet and a wetsuit. Well, it kind of sounds like how Injured Cold seemed like he was trying to imitate what he thought humans would look like yeah. and what he thought would fit in with humans, but wasn't quite there. Right. So maybe it's a similar thing where he was trying to imitate what he saw people wearing. So he's like, Oh, they wear like cloaks and I've like seen people wearing helmets or whatever. So like, yeah, this is normal, right? Yeah. This is close enough. So it's like, otherwise why my, okay. This is, as I was listening to you speak, this is what I was <laughs> You're theorizing. This is, this is my theory. Okay. Yes. So a lot of the spring Hill Jack, like his abilities and like the descriptions of him seem very like technological to me. Like he seems almost like steampunky, yeah. like biometric. Like, so what I was thinking, so the, the glowing red eyes mm. could be like led lights essentially, or like some sort of lights for his eyes, mm-hmm. the ability to breathe blue flame. I'm pretty sure if you burn propane, it's like a bright blue. Mm-hmm. Um, so that could be like some sort of, and like if he's wearing like a helmet, it could be some sort of like helmet apparatus thing where he like has like a fire breathing spout from his mouth that just has propane funneling out of it, Mm -hmm. like glowing red eyes or like two lights. Um, his ability to jump could be like, like some sort of like actuator or like springs, like actual springs in his heels or whatever that like give him the ability to jump or some sort of like pneumatic way to like you know help his knees jump higher or something Mm. it all seems very technological and 
the metal claws, yep. the oil skin like suit. Yep. It sounds like a almost like a like an Iron Man suit yep. or like somebody built this like f- like suit to like fight in or create like this like like a tax suit kind of. Yeah. So what if this was okay? So as you mentioned, there were many people who said that like the government was aware of these things going on, but wouldn't talk about it and wouldn't like yep. do anything about it. Mm-hmm. So what if this was some like dude who designed this like military suit for the like the british military and either went rogue and just started doing crazy shit yeah or all of this was some weird like test of the suit to see if how well it could work or whatever yeah um and so like the government knew about it but they didn't want to say anything about it because like it was their special project or something Mm -hmm. and like the whole him like attacking women and like trying to kiss them and like the whole like yeah weird like sexual component of it Mm -hmm. makes me think that it's not just like some cryptid because i don't feel like a cryptid or like a alien would have any interest in like right sexual relations in any way yeah so why would he be grabbing this girl and trying to like kiss her and stuff and like it's exactly. an obsession with like servant girls mm-hmm. seems very much like how a serial killer chooses their like their victim pool or whatever yeah so it all seems very human yeah and almost like a human like batman kind of human or iron yeah. man where like they, they're like a normal human who just like uses technology to like do these crazy things yeah that yeah. was what i was thinking the whole time he's bizarre in every way right it's just, yeah, again, not actually really killing anybody. Yeah, right. focusing on kind of like a certain segment of the population, at least like for certain things, like his servant girl obsession yeah. with people that he would kind of like jump out from the alley. But then like also he's hanging out at like these barracks, like military barracks. Yeah. But then he's also jumping out at these carriage drivers and making them crash. Right. Like it's all bizarre, but it's like still three very specific. You know, and then there's like a random gardener. Animal skins. Yeah, wearing animal skins. Like just none of it makes any sense. And yeah, so again, that's why he, we kind of put these two guys together in an episode because it was just like, where else, Right. where else are they going to go? Because, Hard to classify. Yeah. And again, he seems like he could have some immortal quality to him just in the fact that he seems like he was around for a while. And again, who knows how long he was around before that, Right. how long he was around after that. Um, I didn't really get into like... I know there were potentially similar figures spotted, you know, in other parts of the world at different time periods. I didn't really get into all that. Um, But just like any kind of weird figure in cryptid, like there's usually other sightings of something similar that doesn't have the same name, but has some of the same characteristics. Right. Just like the Mothman, like being seen in different parts of the world, like same idea. So yeah, I have no idea what the hell he is. Hmm. He's just a weird demon prankster, maybe human, maybe... Yeah, maybe supernatural. It's very strange that yeah. nothing about that story, like, fits together, I feel like. No. But, yeah, people were just, like, terrorized by this guy for a while. And all these people, like, lost their minds. Right. Just being, having encounters with spring Heel Jack. So, yeah. Hmm. That's, that's the man. Interesting. The man, the mystery, the legend. spring Heel Jack. Whatever the hell, if he's a man. Right. I don't know. Person. I don't, I don't know what the hell he is. Right. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's no clear gender there. No. There's nothing, yeah. I mean, if he is some kind of extraterrestrial or something, he just chose right. a specific look to him. Right. Chose an aesthetic. Like, yeah, there's like a lot of people wearing cloaks down there. Yeah. They like cloaks and helmets. Yeah, right. Right. And like skin tight stuff under the cloaks. Right. That's a thing. Yeah. You yeah, like saw like some, some, some like fisherman dude wearing that oil skin and he's yeah. like, oh, and then you just throw a cloak in there. And yeah, just this, throw a cloak. This helmet from this guy over here. Yeah. yeah. Like, Put some claws on. I'm gonna look. Do- I'm gonna look dope. I'm gonna look, dope. I'm gonna look sick. The the illustrations of him do look kind of dope. Do they? He looks kind of cool. Wow. Again, he looks very yeah. Just I don't even know. It's hmm. bizarre. He's bizarre. So I couldn't help but picture him in like weird different colors. I don't really think that was a thing. Because again, I was picturing like injured cold in his like right. metallic green and blue suits. Right. But I don't think I was think I was trying to merge the two in yeah. my mind a little too much. But yeah, some similar qualities hmm. where you're kind of unclear. Like, are you? really a person are you trying to resemble a person if you are a person what the fuck are you doing right what's going on man? yeah are you yeah are you part of like some kind of government experiment right you went rogue maybe that's why you're not killing anybody because you're just trying to fuck around around for a while no idea but interesting yeah one of those things where it's like the encounters were all like a little too similar to really be people totally making it up at least at first you know before things are fully publicized it's like that's a little specific there's, like, a guy who looks like a devil who breathed, like, different colored flames at me. Right. 
that seems like a very saw specific something. thing. Yeah. The first few people definitely saw something. Definitely saw something. And yeah, that's a little bit more than just, you know, somebody attacked me and I kind of warped the memory in my brain. Like, that's a little, right. little specific for, you know, some type of, like, if, even if he was trying to, like, I don't know if he was attempting rape for real or if he was just... Right. Who knows? Maybe the attempted kissing, like, kind of was him not being human and trying to, like, imitate stuff that he had seen. Like, oh, true, yeah. seeing people kissing and stuff and not realizing as a non-human, like, that that's not a thing that you just do to strangers. Right. You just jump out of the darkness and yeah. then, like, s- like, squeeze them with your corpse hands and start <laughs> yeah, kissing them. Cold, clammy corpse hands and just being like, hey, hey maybe he just didn't know. <sighs> he's just confused and then people are, like, freaking out and then he runs away because he's like, whoa, what? Like, I did something wrong. Yeah, that's what you're supposed yeah. to do. Yeah. So, very confusing. Very confusing. Yeah, I've got no theories. Like, for... I mean, I don't often have theories. I'm usually just like, what the fuck? But this one in particular, like, just no... No theories. My vote's for the the Bionic Man theory. Yeah. That's what I think. That's It sounds very Tony Stark or yeah. fucking Bruce Wayne to me. I feel like Tony Stark would fuck around with people. Right, and that, like, like makes sense. Like, that could, that could totally be canon. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Jumping out at, like, carriage drivers, just like, hey! Yeah. And then making them crash. Never watched a single Iron Man movie. I'm not really a big fan. No. No. I'm not a fan of superheroes in general. But, like, Robert Downey Jr. is kind of a dick. Yeah. And... The little that I've seen of Tony Stark, like, he's also kind of a dick. Yeah. I feel like it kind of works. Life imitates art, or art imitates life. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so that's episode seven. Episode seven. Crazy. Weird Immortals. Weird Immortals. Count of St. Germain. Spring Heel Jack. Jack. Yeah. Yeah, so let us know what you think. Check us out in all the places that we exist online. Many of them. Which I feel like you know already. I bet so. But. Because you're listening to this right now on something. Exactly. Um, Instagram's the big one. Yep. Find us wherever you listen to your podcasts, yep. which you're doing right now. Right now. So we probably need to tell you that. Leave us a review. Yes, leave us a review or at least a rating. Um, and yeah, if you have anything you want us to talk about, let us know. Seriously. We have a whole list and whatever you're going to say might be on the list. Yeah. Might not be. There's like 80% chances on the list. Right. But if it's not, we definitely want to know. Right. So hit us up. Sweet. All right. Episode seven. It's done. Cool. This I'm is Gray. <laughs> I'm Justine. This is Unknowable. Unknowable. All right. Love you. <laughs>